author Paul Leslie Hour, helping people tell their stories. And now, your host, Paul Leslie. Hey, it's me. Hi, and welcome, friend. Always an honor to have you with us here on the Paul Leslie Hour. The interview you're about to hear is with Brad Rogers. This originally broadcast on a radio series called The Birth of a Parrothead Nation, The Magic of the Music. I came up with this idea along with my friend Monty Toller. We called Monty Toller the creative consultant for this series, and the idea was pretty simple. I had interviewed just about everyone associated with Jimmy Buffett, but what about Jimmy Buffett's fans? I don't think there is any musician in the world, maybe with the exception of Elvis Presley, or maybe the Grateful Dead, maybe, that has quite the following that Jimmy Buffett has. It's truly an incredible thing, a phenomenon. It's inspiring, and it's kind of crazy. But one thing is for sure, the moments that people have spent at Jimmy Buffett concerts are moments well spent. One person who might concur is Brad Rogers. When we came up with the idea to do this series, one name kept being put forth. Brad Rogers. You need to interview Brad Rogers. Why don't you interview Brad Rogers? Hey, have you thought about interviewing Brad Rogers? His fandom of Jimmy Buffett went beyond just being a mere fan. It got to the point his enthusiasm, his pageantry, his costumes, and his antics led him to be one of those guys who entertains the crowds before the concert. At that time, it was called the Sports Magic Team. Well, Brad Rogers was one of those guys. He experienced a lot of things related to the Atlanta Parrot Head Club, and now the Atlanta Parrot Head Club is going to be turning 30 years old. They're going to be having a big celebration in July, a concert party, festival, extravaganza, whatever you want to call it. And so we're bringing these interviews out. I hope you enjoy. Let me know what you think of the Brad Rogers interview. We're exploring the magic of the music, the birth of a parrot head nation. And it is with great pleasure that we welcome our subject, Brad Rogers. Thank you very much for joining us. And I'm joined by our creative consultant for this series, Monty Toller. So welcome to the program, Brad Rogers. Well, thank you for having me. Um, It's been a long journey uh, being a parrot head, and uh, I'm happy to be here and answer any questions you have for me. Well, fabulous. First of all, just to get a little background on you, where are you from? Uh, I originally grew up in Stamford, Connecticut. I ended up about 30 miles from New York City. Um, I ended up going to school in South Carolina, and um, my particular school had a lot of people from Florida. That was my first real exposure to Buffett music. I went to my first show in Charlotte, North Carolina in 1988, and I'm up to approximately 60 shows. Uh, now that, that's including the times I've, I've caught Jimmy in his bar and that kind of thing. I think big shows, I'm, I'm around the 50, 50 count since 1988. What was it about Jimmy Buffett's music that you liked so much? Well, it's kind of funny. Uh, In my high school class, I was voted quietest, and I was runner-up to shyest. And I think some of my roommates uh, in college and the introduction of ethanol, (laughs) um, my personality changed a little bit, I think, for the better. And, you know, when I got exposed to you know, the the base of fans that Jimmy has developed through the years at my first show, I thought, well, you know, this this is just too much fun. I'd been sorry that I had uh, missed it uh, all the years that Jimmy had been doing it before that, and, and I really didn't know about it. And after listening to the lyrics, um, I Love the Beach, I, his musical stylings, I guess, uh, uh, I really enjoyed listening to. And um, after my first show, it just took off from there. Was there ever a song in particular that you especially liked? When I meet new parrot heads and, you know, they claim that they're a big fan of all of his music, I always ask them, 
if you were on your deathbed in the hospital and Jimmy Buffett walked in and said that he was going to play you one song, I asked people, you know, what would it be and why? And when people ask me that, or like like the question you just asked me, a particular song, it kind of depends on my mood. Because uh, Jimmy's songs run from the, you know, out of control party songs to the very sensitive meaning of life songs. The answer I usually uh, give to that question is he went to Paris. And it's a nice, slow, sensitive song, you know, about a, a guy who had been through a lot in life, but he just kept plugging along. And uh, I always say that when I die, I want the next to last line on my tombstone. And that's uh, some of it's magic, some of it's tragic, but I had a good life all the way. That's the song that I always go back to. It just kind of wraps up my attitude that uh, to me relates to Jimmy's music. Uh, you know, we go through good and bad things, but just keep plugging along, keep having fun. And uh, it's all worth it in the end. Brad, you even took it upon yourself to not only become a, a parrot head and enjoy the concerts, but uh, you even dressed up so much that you had the the license plate and you had the dance with the bottle on your head and you had the, the, the shark nose. What inspired you to become that consummate parrot head tailgate person to not only entertain yourself, but entertain others? I'd like to thank all of us, but I know I have a little bit of showmanship, show-off, whatever, in me. Um, I've had a few jobs that have been along those lines. But, um, you know, when I went to my first show, I, I had a shark fin hat and a Hawaiian shirt, and and that was it as far as costume goes. And seeing other people that had little you know, uh, a parrot earring or whatever, some little accessory that incorporated the lyric of a song, you know, whether it was a pack of juicy fruit on their hat or, or, or whatever. Um, I just thought, well, you know, that's cool. This is just like Jimmy says, you know, this is an escape through the years. I can't quite explain why I'm a competitive person. Uh, at times I played in sports through college and I wanted to be more of a parrot head than everybody else. I guess that's part of my the reason that I uh, continued to add to my concert attire uh, with the shark fin hat, the, the parrot beak, parrot earrings, license plate grass skirt. I even found some parrot slippers in the women's department at Macy's that I wear to shows. But uh, And then, of course, uh, in a holster on my hip, I have my conch shell horn, which always seems to be a, a crowd pleaser. But um, as far as explaining why, I don't know. Um, you know, I always uh, read Jimmy's lyrics, uh, read his liner notes. I I pride myself on Buffett trivia, and um, I don't know, maybe it's the competitive spirit. I just wanted to, to be a better parrot head than everybody else. That's the best answer I can get to that. <laughs> How did you discover the Atlanta Parrot Head Club? Where, can you remember the first time that you met the members of the club? Well, in Atlanta... Um, I, uh, and this was shortly after my first show, um, I, I either heard an ad on the radio or, or saw it in the, the leisure newspaper in Atlanta, uh, creative loafing about a, uh, you know, a parrot head party. And I think it was a few weeks before Jimmy came to town. Um, and the club had just celebrated their first anniversary. So I was, I was in pretty early with the club and, uh, I think, uh, they kicked me out of the trivia contest that night. And shortly after that, I started going to uh, the happy hours that they used to have at good old days in Sandy Springs on Roswell Road. Things just took off from there. Um, you know, whenever I met somebody that said they liked Buffett, sure, you let them know about the club. Or when people would come, um, his uh, life attitude and the typical parrot head attitude is uh, kind of infectious. You know, people like to be around it. You know, the club's grown since then. But um, going to that first party, and I think that was late 89 or maybe 1990. Since then, I've, I've been involved with the Atlanta Club, and you know everybody knows how, how much it's taken off since then. If you look at the Atlanta Parrothead Club from 1989, and actually the, the Parrothead Nation as a whole, it never has really peaked because it just keeps growing and growing. Why do you think that is? Oh, gosh. I, you know, I think every year... Well, for a few years in the middle there, Jimmy said, you know, this is it, I'm going to retire, but he's having too much fun doing it, and he can't seem to retire. And uh, I, I think there's some good and the bad to it. 
and, and this is all my opinion, <laughs> the more the um, Parrot Head Nation grew, and especially the concert parking lot parties grew, uh, not only in numbers and number of shows and size of shows, but, uh, you know, the, the lengths people went to uh, at the parking lot parties, whether it was decorating their car or bringing a swimming pool or sand and palm trees, um, you know, people hear about what a big party it is, and I think some of the crowd today, uh, especially the younger ones, are just kind of there because they've heard it's such a great party. I hope I'm wrong, but, uh, you know, like I said before, it's uh, the attitude is just infectious. People like to be around it. It's just it's too much fun to pass up, and uh, Jimmy continues to have fun with his shows his charisma on stage when we see him live and, and the amount of fun he has when he plays live, uh, I think it rubs off on people. I think that's true. It's debatable whether or not Jimmy Buffett will ever retire. But if he ever <laughs> did, if he ever did, what do you think would happen to the Parrothead Clubs? Um, that's, that's a, a very good question. Um, and I may... I don't know if people listen to my answer that I'm about to give. Some some people might not agree or might get upset with me, but I think the bigger the clubs get, they get a little bit too political for my tastes. There are power struggles, and this is not only you know changes I've seen in the Atlantic Club, but but other clubs. I've been to I went to the first 14 meetings of the mines. You know I, I saw it in clubs across the country is. The bigger they got, and I understand that when you when you have an organization that gets that big, you have to have organization and people that you know are in charge of certain things and you know safety and legal matters and all that kind of stuff. But uh, that doesn't interest me, and it kind of upsets me when you know the whole idea of of Scott Nickerson starting the Paradigm Club was just have some fun, get some people together who like Jimmy's attitude and uh, you know what his music stands for. You know, and nothing against the Parrot Head Clubs growing, but um, I've seen good and bad with, with the clubs getting that big. I don't think they would, uh, you know, Jimmy's music is going to last forever. And if Jimmy ever does retire or, uh, you know, when he goes off to the big Margaritaville in the sky, um, I think, you know, his music is going to live on. And I, I think, uh, or at least I hope, the clubs live on. It's it's a great place to meet people. Uh you know, I've met lifelong friends um, through the parrot heads, being parrot heads, and uh, so it's very meaningful to people. And I don't think they're gonna just uh, turn them off when Jimmy stops playing. Totally agreeable with you, Brad. And the question is, can you look overall at the parrot head nation and see that even if he stops playing a concert, but the the music would continue to go on when he wants to hang up his guitar do you see the spirit going forward i think so jimmy's whole attitude and you know the uh the attitude that his music personifies um the people that are drawn to that uh you know it's, it's too much fun and meaningful it's it's an escape from the misery of life and whether it's Jimmy's music or some other music that people became aware of through being parrot heads. You know, Jimmy's band, they're, they're the smartest people in the world to associate themselves with Jimmy because they're just going to grow their own fan bases for their own music. And I think, you know, with Meeting the Minds and all the other musical groups that have popped up, uh, you know, whose music is based on attitude, uh, you know, tropical, carefree lifestyle, um, people gravitate to that. And especially, you know, the Parrothead Nation that has gravitated to these other bands that are popping up. You know, I don't know if there will be another Jimmy Buffett. He's a very smart businessman. <laughs> Big charisma and, you know, marketing skills. And, you know, he's he's grown the nation himself. But uh, just the attitude, the people, people are going to look for an escape somewhere. You know, as long as there's Parrot Heads around, I think, uh, whether it's Jimmy or, or another band that, uh, you know, personifies that, they'll they'll have a following. Well, you've got to enjoy uh, the inside life more than most people. Uh, you've been hired by Tim Glancy, and you've worn the stilts, and you've you've played some of the shows. How much fun was that that you got to uh, entertain the crowds of that Parrothead Nation 
and be a part of that. Something I'll certainly never forget. In 1995, I had, uh, I had got very lucky. Uh, Jimmy did two shows in Atlanta. And Jeff Pike of, you know, A1A and the original Atlanta Club uh, won a contest with one radio station who was uh, sponsoring this contest for Jimmy shows. And about two days before Jimmy came to town, another radio station picked up the other show, and I was lucky enough to win and uh, play Cheeseburger in Paradise on stage with Jimmy. I think Jimmy did back-to-back shows. I think it was August 7th for his moment of fame, 1995, and I was August 8th. And I, actually, I won front row seats off the radio that morning, so I got to watch Jeff from the front row. Then the next night, I won the contest and got to be on stage. I don't know if that year will ever get topped as far as going to shows, but <laughs> you know when the uh, the condiment chant comes up, I like mine with lettuce and tomato, and, and they bring the house lights up. When you're standing on stage, um, I can see why Jimmy still does it. Unbelievable rush. And I'd like to also throw out, when, when I won that contest and got to play on stage with Jimmy. It was in part uh, thanks to the Atlanta Parrothead Club. I am not the most accomplished guitarist. (laughs) There were better guitarists than me uh, in the contest, but I held my own, and I think my Atlanta Parrothead Club fans, it was a crowd response who who determined the winner, and uh, they they certainly got me up on stage. Uh, Jimmy made fun of me, and I certainly expected that with a license plate, a parrot beak, and you know, parrot slippers on my feet. Uh, but it was all in good fun and uh, something I will never forget. Several years after that, let's see, I believe it was uh, late 2001, I was working with Tim Glancy and Sports Magic Team. Tim was touring with Jimmy, uh, doing his uh, entertaining thing, shooting the T-shirts and walking on stilts. And, um, and I was working with him with the parrot heads down in Key West and... Uh, a potential hurricane scared us off the island a day early, and Tim lives down there, and he got caught, couldn't get off the island, where uh, I was able to get out of there on Saturday a day early, and uh, Jimmy was playing in Atlanta on Monday. And I had been working with Tim's organization with the Atlanta Braves, uh, entertaining fans at Braves games. And when I got out of there and Tim couldn't, gave me a call and said, Brad, I'm, I'm stuck here in Key West. You're going to have to work the show for me. Do, you know, do you think you can do that? And boy, that was a tough answer. Of course, I immediately jumped on that. And uh, it, was, it was very neat uh, getting to be backstage before the show, uh, you know, sitting on the corner of the stage, listening to them do uh, sound check, seeing how much fun they have on stage. To me, you know, he still has fun doing it. You can, you can see that when you, when you go to a show, but getting to partake and be part of the show, um, something I'll never forget, uh, on stage playing in 95. And then again, in 2001, when I got to work a show in place of, uh, Tim Glancy, you know, shooting t-shirts to the crowd and making, uh, thin hats out of balloons and, uh, that kind of thing. Um, uh, I guess it was kind of a boost to my uh, superior, I'm a better parrot head than you, ego also. But uh, something I'll never forget, and a whole lot of fun. Is it true that you came up with the name Parrot Heads in Paradise? Actually, yes. When the club started taking off, and they were popping up everywhere, and people were calling Margaritaville in Key West and saying, you know, I've, I've heard there's parrot head clubs, you know, how do I do this? And they started referring people to Scott Nickerson. You know, he kind of said, well, this, this is what we do. And that's, that's about the time the community service projects really started taking off. And when we realized, you know, this whole thing was getting big uh, with clubs everywhere, I can't remember who it was that decided, you know, let's, let's put us all together and make it a national organization now worldwide. And we were sitting in a restaurant in Atlanta called Tropics. I don't know, there were probably eight or ten, maybe a dozen Atlanta Parrot Head Club members there, and, you know, Scott was telling us about, we're going to start a national organization, and he said, you know, so if anybody comes up with any ideas for a name, fire away, and who knows, it just popped into my head, Parrot Heads in Paradise, and Scott goes, that's that's perfect. Everybody agree with that, and everybody seemed to like it, so I guess I have that distinction of naming the national organization. It's been a great pleasure talking to you. Thank you very, very much for this interview, Brad Rogers, and I have one final question. What would you like to say to all the people that are listening in? Oh, my gosh. Well, if you're parrot heads, um, I don't need to say anything to you. You guys know what's going on. For those who are not parrot heads, 
like that line from He Went to Paris that I said before, some of it's magic, some of it's tragic, but I had a great life all the way. Um, keep plugging along. Uh, you know, if, if, if you keep going, something's going to go right. You're going to have fun. Uh, the attitude that, that Jimmy and his music promote uh, is something that everybody can, should, and will enjoy if, if they give it a chance. Nobody could ever say that you were not a parrothead, that's for certain. <laughs> <laughs> well, fins up to everybody. <laughs> fins up. Thank you. Certainly. Thanks. A boobopery, a boobop shy, a keen appetite, a seek a boo to get gone. Goodbye.